Hi, everyone, and welcome back. This was a short 15 minute break, um, but <laughs> I hope that you still have you now some time to relax and maybe stretch yourself. Um, that's very important too. So um, we will now continue with the next two presentations on uh, where we're learning about hands-on methods for critical making. Um, this session explores participatory research approaches. Um, and uh, this third presentation uh, is going to come from um, Reem Talbo. Uh, but <laughs> I hope that you still have now some time to relax and maybe stretch yours. I am not sure what's happening. We can go on. I think. Okay. <laughs> Then I will go on. I'm sorry about that, Reem. So <laughs> we're going to hear from you about um, experience-centered design as a critical approach uh, to current methods of uh, humanitarian in innovation and a lot more. Um, yes. The floor is yours. Uh, and we're still collecting questions in our Miro board. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Can you see my full slide? Yes. Brilliant. <laughs> um, so thank you so much uh, for inviting me to be a part of this. I've been listening to all the discussions and they've been amazing. Um, so I'm Reem Talhu, I'm a research fellow at Northumbria University. And today I wanted to talk about how do we work towards critical counter narratives while working in the humanitarian in the innovation space? Ooh. So let's start with stories. In Lebanon, there is a Syrian refugee community that lives in this tented settlement. The Lebanese government adopted a laissez-faire approach, which meant that refugees had to find their own places to live and had to negotiate rent with landlords. And this left many refugees with only the option of renting land from a Lebanese landlord in rural areas to set up informal tented settlements. Three towns away, there is a community that is living in another, ref uh, another refugee community that is living in um, two buildings that they rent out. These buildings are enclosed by a wall and with only one gate, and it's on the outskirts of a town. The buildings are worn down and not maintained. They often suffer from mold, mold, water leaking in the form in from the windows, and there's no way to retain heat um, during the winter. These buildings were built at the start of the Syrian war specifically to be rented out only to refugees. Both the buildings and the tented settlements are spaces designed to marginalize refugees, not only by keeping them separate from the Lebanese, but also maintaining poor living conditions that negatively impact health and that are often far from the services that they need to access like healthcare clinics and aid centers. More importantly, it is in these spaces and the wider system that they lose their agency as individuals and as communities. During my work with refugees in Lebanon, they would often say, we could not say anything. This is not our country. And refugees describe their experiences as that of survival. It is in these spaces that we see the defuturing of these refugee communities as they lose a facilitative environment that would have created space for them to imagine and work towards a future and new worlds that they want and aspire for. They are not given the space to imagine a life otherwise. And these defuturing narratives extend to the services and humanitarian technologies that they experience and are very much related to how they are designed and what narrative they are reinforcing. When one woman in the tented settlement, Aziza, is pregnant, she's advised to go to a primary health care clinic. In those clinics, she experiences discrimination. She feels unwanted and looked down on. When Aziza sees the doctor, she's not given the opportunity to ask questions. The doctor is rude to her and prescribes medications without explaining to her why she needs them. Aziza has no choice to go to another doctor because this is the only clinic that she can afford paying transportation to go to. And she often relies on other women in her community for advice about her pregnancy. If she can avoid going to the clinic, she would. In the other town, the majority of the women their, and their families are food insecure. 
They have the limited ability to purchase food that they need and food that they prefer. This is amplified by the Lebanese government's labor policy that limits refugees to only working in agriculture or construction, which is very seasonal. And oftentimes refugees say that they weren't paid fully for the work that they did, but they could not argue with their employer. So one of the only ways that they're able to be food secure is to rely on food aid. To provide food aid for refugees in Lebanon, refugees are given e-vouchers such as the one held in that picture. E-voucher cards are like debit cards. The World Food Program deposits money in each refugee's card and the refugee can use that card to buy only food and only from shops that are registered with the program. Here we clearly see how the technology's restriction to only food purchases is reflective of the funders' values that state that they want to ensure that their donations are only used to purchase food and nothing else. And in the community I was working with, they had several problems with this e-voucher system. When their aid was stopped, they were not given a reason why, and they could not challenge the decision. They would call the center as instructed, and they would be told that this may be by mistake. Someone pressed the wrong button. They would have negative experiences in the shops. The shop owners, just like in the clinics, would be rude to them. One shop I visited that was not registered with the World Food Program as part of the e-voucher system said that they did not want Syrian refugees in their shop bothering their Lebanese customers. Also, because transportation costs were considered high by refugees, they were dependent on only one shop in their town where they can use their e-vouchers. This shop was more expensive compared to other shops, but they could not challenge his pricing because they were dependent on him. They were also dependent on him to conduct gray area transactions. Basically, the woman in the community wanted to use their e-vouchers to buy products other than food, such as washing liquid. They viewed that a clean kitchen is as important to their food security as having food. So they would tell the shop owner, I want to buy washing liquid. The shop owner would then say yes, but because I am taking a risk by breaking the rules of the food aid system, I will sell you the washing liquid but for a higher price. The woman would then agree, and the shop owner would then scan in food items to amount to the price of the washing up liquid. This left the woman even more dependent on the shop owner, and they felt less able to negotiate prices with him. Lastly, when the woman had cash available to them, they would engage in collective purchasing. They would pull their money together and buy a big box of tomatoes, for example at a discounted drug price because they are buying in bulk. And they would then divide that box amongst themselves. They cannot do that with their e-vouchers because it is designed for a household and given to a household level. And so when shop owners were at, uh, and so when we talked to shop owners about um, enabling collective purchasing, they said, but we can't sell in bulk to refugees because we were advised that we shouldn't because we worry that they would benefit from a discounted price, portion the food up, and then sell it at a market price to others. In both these stories, we see how the marginalization of refugees is a product of governmental policies, social and political discrimination. These are amplified by services and technologies not accounting for the so so social and political in their designs. They act as if they are not there, in the, and in the instance of the e-voucher system, it amplifies marginalization by not acknowledging that the technologies are situated within very tense social and political spaces. These innovations and services can be viewed as a neoliberal approach to aid, where aid and services are managed from afar by being, being delegated to local actors. Duffield refers to this term as technologies of abandonment. And don't get me wrong, the localization agenda is essential. Local actors should have more agency within the aid system. But where is refugees agency in all of this? Where are refugees values and practices and the experiences that they want to have embedded in the innovations and services being made? 
So in my work, I wanted to restart these stories from the perspective and experiences of refugees and with them inspire, design, and create innovations. For the case of accessing healthcare, through conversations with refugee women, they express that they want to have more meaningful and dignified conversations with healthcare providers, conversations that differ from their experiences in clinics. They also highlighted that as women, they share health information amongst each other. And there's usually, only, there's usually one person that they all go to for advice. They envisioned a way to communicate with healthcare providers as a collective without having to pay for transportation unless indicated by the doctor that they, have no, that they have to come to the clinic. So we went about designing a community health radio show where refugees are in charge of the conversation. How did it work? The women selected the health topics that reflected the health issues they are facing. We then partnered with a local NGO that had, had clinics in the vicinity and we recruited doctors and nurses from there. Through a mobile phone, a refugee woman would be a host for the community radio show and would steer the conversation with the doctor. The listeners, i.e. the other women in the community, would then indicate that they have questions and proceed to ask their health-related questions for advice. Through this medium, the woman reported being more comfortable voicing their concerns to healthcare providers. The host was able to point out to the healthcare provider that they need to provide clearer responses. The woman also coordinated their questions. And in some instances where one woman was shy to ask their question, the other woman would encourage her. More importantly, the healthcare providers reported changing their perceptions of refugee women. One healthcare provider said that she was surprised by how engaged the women were and that she now knows that they are not ignorant. So what we see here is that by centering the experiences that refugee women want, and embedding it in the configuration of the technology, we were able to increase refugee agency within the relationship with, with healthcare providers and work towards changing the narrative around refugees. For the case study on food security, we worked on designing a blockchain-based technology to enable the practice of collective purchasing by mocking up the potential interactions that refugees wanted. Why blockchain? Well, it was because the World Food Program was trialing out a blockchain system that functioned in the same way as the e-voucher system. So bringing in a new technology, but not exploring its all, all the different potentials it can have in terms of interactions. As we mocked it up, we witnessed refugee women coming together to negotiate as a community what they want to buy. Even through this mock-up study, participants started forming groups that would go food shopping together to share transportation costs and benefit from discounts. Shop owners offered discounts to the community and even offered to provide delivery because of the large purchases. Women started extending the process to other refugees outside of their geographical community. And they started voicing what points they want to negotiate on with shop owners and agreeing that they will not buy from shops that have discriminated against them before. Here we see that the configuration of the potential technology enables refugees to action collective practices that gain them negotiating powers. In doing so, we would be shifting refugees from being individuals that aid is acted upon to collectives that negotiate aid. So what is underpinning all of this work? It is the experience-centered design approach we used, where we asked, what are your experiences? What are the experiences you want? And what are the values and beliefs that you want to shape your experiences? We did this work in a dialogical manner that was responsive to the aspirations, anger, and frustrations of refugees. We explored the emotions that result from experiences and interactions with technologies, services, and the aid system, and the host community. In doing so, the intersection of the social and political with refugees' everyday lives became the center of the design process because their experiences, values, and beliefs are shaped by these sociopolitical factors. This centering enables the design of technologies that while deliver aid and services, create spaces for refugees to practice their agency and their beliefs. This in turn creates a counter-narrative to neoliberal approaches to aid 
that view refugees as individuals or household beneficiaries rather than active collectives with aspirations, rights, and demands. So now I'm gonna to move to give, um, giving you a brief snapshot of the practicality of doing this work, where we considered three important factors within experience-centered design. And that is to enable dialogue, responsiveness, and to create a shared understanding through empathetic listening. So <clears throat> looking at the case study around food security, when I first went to the community, I knocked on every door and sat with each woman interested. We discussed the issue of food security, and I, th I then showed them all the different ways we can explore the issues further. So basically the design methods that we could potentially use. And we discussed what the design process might look like as a whole. Refugee women wanted time to reflect on it and also wanted to understand well, what does it mean to participate in a design process? What would it feel like? So I went back again and sat with each woman where we did a demo of what participation might look like. They gave feedback and we adjusted things accordingly. After that, women signed up to participate. This responsive process was essential because it was through this process that we started to establish that the work and the design process and myself we respond to what refugees want and envision as a way of working together. It is also through this process that we start to gain a shared understanding of what the work is. We then move to the stage of co-producing collective narratives. We used cards as a means of telling stories. The cards represented different factors that revolve around the issues of food security. Women were also able to use to make their own cards. They would then collectively select and negotiate cards to produce stories that reflect their experiences and talk about why these experiences arose and why and how they feel about it and what angers them about it. This dialogical approach enabled us to reach the shared understanding of each other, the factors impacting them individually and collectively. The selection and negotiation process enabled the airing out of frustrations and emotions. I personally was also able to use the cards to share my story and who I am as a human and as a woman. After collecting those collective nar narratives, I, we put representative co quotes from the narratives and presented them back to the community where they added, removed and negotiated and debated them. This showed empathetic listening and enabled further dialogue. And then collectively at the beginning of the project, the women were interested in, in making an artifact to ref reflect their experiences. And so after doing all the work of, of, create, of kind of creating a shared understanding based on collective narratives, we grouped together with the women, we grouped the narratives and co-created a booklet. The booklet as an artifact gives voice to their experiences in the way that they wanted to, using their quotes, their drawings, and their experiences. They also wanted the booklet as a means of giving advice to others. This not only helped us reach a shared understanding of the practices that they value, but also emphasized the communal value that they hold dearly. The data from the narratives and booklets were then used to create vignettes that were based on their experiences to further explore collective purchasing as a collective practice that they wanted to further action. Based on that, I then created potential journey maps for a technology that would enable collective purchasing. This was presented back to participants and they told me how to adapt it, et cetera, to make the mock-up study work for them. We then made the mock-up tools that participants used and, and reached the, the and, and proceeded with the mock-up study as I presented earlier. In conclusion, when using this approach, it is important that the whole process is in dialogue with participants and responsive to what they want. So we're not only empathetically listening to create a new innovation, but also empathetically listening to how communities want to design and innovate. This builds relationships and safe spaces that are conducive of sharing experiences, values, and beliefs. Spaces of care where we can be critical. 
I've put this picture on my last slide because I think it fully reflects the approach. When the women were working on the community health radio project, we were making paper tools to coordinate the health conversations. And they opted to use colors that correspond with street lights for go, wait, and stop. Because they had never had the experience of driving, they had the colors reversed. So red was for go. And that was more than five because we had a shared understanding of what those colors stood for in that design space and in that instance, and what the intended interactions and experiences were mediated through those paper tools. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so much for this very, very insightful presentation. And thank you so much for actually taking the time to explain to us um, what, you know, the. The, the local situation um, that we do not necessarily understand, um, or a lot of us don't understand. I really appreciate that. And I also really appreciate just that you, you know, you're creating opportunities um, for exchange and for the voices um, to be heard, whether it's via radio or, you know, I'm a huge fan of community radios um, or, just, or just other tools. I am seeing that some questions are coming in. So I would maybe ask my colleagues first if anyone in the video stream has a question. I think one question was posed by Vicky, right? So Vicky, please go ahead. Yes, um, thank you so much, Reem. That was so good, so inspiring. Everything that Regina said and more, and also so instructive of, because you were so kind to share how you did it. And I particularly liked how you used the new technology blockchain to also question the system behind it. So not just protect, keep the system, but also to question that. And um, I wanted to ask whether and how the reaction from the World Food Program was. So what was really interesting with that work is that when we approached the World Food Program to tell them about the work and to involve them in the work, um, we were told that they are currently not engaging with researchers outside the World Food Program. Um, it was, I think, during a time that they were relooking how they do research with actors and their data sharing. Um, and so that in itself shows that there's this barrier of between those of us who are working outside the institutions to be critical and those within the institutions. And that's a very difficult divide. So what we have been doing is that when, um, so one of my collaborators, she does the food assessments and the food needs assessments for refugees for the World Food Program. She brings it up in every meeting uh, <laughs> about collective purchasing, about the vulnerabilities that are arising from the e-voucher system. And soon after our work, the World Food Program launched the Dalili project, which aims to kind of publicly show food prices and so on. And I think it's an ongoing conversation and it's an ongoing barrier that we need to break. But the reality always is that funders will have a say on what they want these innovations and services to deliver. And another barrier is that when, when I speak the language of rights and social justice, um, big international NGOs would say, but we are not human rights organizations. We are aid organizations. Um, when I'm talking about discrimination, I, they cannot bring that up because that means tension between their stance and that of the Lebanese government. Even when I publish my papers, I don't put the word discrimination in because that would put my collaborators at risk of being at odds with the wider system. So it is a lot of um, activist work throughout every single action and every single meeting. And it's frustrating. And it's hard because I just want to shout it out um, and scream it out, but we can't. 
Um, and so it is trying to kind of constantly push against the system, push, push against these technologies at every opportunity that we can to say things can be different and refugees want them to be different. So let's listen. There is another question uh, shaping up here on our Miro board. So I will just wait for the person to finish typing it up. Thank you so <laughs> much for the reply. I really hear you. Thanks. I think it might be ready. Yes, there's a question mark at the end. And while the rest is being typed up, I will just start reading it in the hope that the person who posted it agrees with what they already put on the post-it. So, <clears throat> was there a shared understanding with the field workers on the ground about the underlying blockchain system? What were the challenges um, with the smartphone devices? Right, um, so the blockchain system was being trialed in Jordan and piloted in Jordan while I did the, we did the work in Lebanon because we can see it coming that after this pilot in Jordan, it will possibly come to Lebanon. So we weren't able to talk um, to field workers on the ground about the underlying blockchain system. But one of the key issues that came up when I was working with that refugee community is that when they initially met me, they viewed me as a field worker. And they initially did not want me in their spaces um, because they were fed up with field workers saying they'd come in, ask us a questionnaire. Why do they need to be two people in here? Do they not feel safe? Why can't one person only come? Um, I would, when I was in that doing that work, I would sit. So Syr um, the Syrian communities that I were I was working with, they like to sit on the floor on like special kind of um, sofas that is of their culture. So I would naturally sit with them um, and they would say the field workers always ask for a chair to sit on. And so again, there's this disconnect between field workers and refugees that even when field workers are often within those spaces, that space for being critical isn't there because of these small well, in my, in my view, they're not small, but because of these ways of interacting that enforce the power asymmetries within the system. And when it came to the challenges with smartphone devices, so when they were, because um, as part of the um, work after the Dalili app came out, I evaluated it with the community. Um, it required an internet connection all the time. So if you're in a shop and you want to check the prices compared to other shops, um, you, most of the women didn't have a 3G connection, um, so they weren't able to do that. And, and, there, and there is, and this is, I didn't talk about it, there is, there is still that digital divide. There's still that digital literacy divide, um, which meant that at the beginning when refugees got their e-voucher cards, they had never, they hadn't used banking in that way before they would give their card and PIN number to the shop owner to keep. And afterwards, after they, they kind of learned how to use it, they, they realized that the shop owners were, were putting more stuff onto the bill, but not giving them those items. Um, and so, so it's not related directly to smartphone devices, but what we view as the potentials for smartphone devices is much different to refugees because they use it in much different ways. So they are very comfortable using Facebook, WhatsApp, and so on. But once we start introducing other apps, there's still that barrier. Um, and so we really need to think of what, when we are, and this is the next step in relation to kind of designing for collective purchasing, is how do we design it to be some elements mediated by mobile phones, but in a manner that's intuitive to them. Um, and I say some elements because um, when we were kind of thinking of the mock-up study together, they said, we don't need to have a mock-up for this part because we'll just sit together and, and negotiate and decide what we want to do. And then we'll put it into 
the mobile phone for it to work. And so where we put these technologies within these community spaces and the process of collective action is quite important. Thank you so much <clears throat> for those insights. I have um, one last question for you, uh, if I may, and that is actually asking you for advice because you drew my attention to the fact that we tend to use um, the word uh, citizen a lot in citizen innovation, citizen participation, but not necessarily everyone that we work with is actually a citizen in that setting where they live, for example, in refugee camps. So can you help me a little bit, maybe also just turn our vocabulary into something more um, accessible or understandable and also more inclusive? Um, what you know? How do you how do you describe um, these these things that we do, if not with the word <clears throat> citizen? Yeah, so I never use the word citizen at all because even citizen as a word and as a construct already has so many implications of what it means to be a good citizen, um, and it also has associated rights that not everyone has. Um, at the beginning of the work with re refugees, because I don't even like the word refugees because that tends to homogenize and group people in one group. But I use it because of the lack of a better nuanced term. And because for the specific case study um, around kind of the food security, uh, we had that discussion. We had that discussion with the woman, like how, well, how do you refer to yourselves? And they say Syrian, but here we are refugees. And then they talked about the difference between refugees and displaced and, and, and the different languages that they use. So they went for the term refugees in the co-creation of the booklet. But that debate in itself showed how, how the labels that we give are never going to be as nuanced as they need to be, because we're always trying to group people. And we're always trying to, to, to say these characteristics are of this group and and that's difficult and and even in the different refugee communities that I've worked with they're never one community they're often divided into different social groups um, and that has been difficult to communicate but but they're not difficult to account for in a design process and that's what we always need to think about is how to be inclusive how to enable different participants to select the design methods that they're more comfortable using, how to en enable them to interact with each other in a way that they are most comfortable. So if you wanna be doing it as part of a group, yeah. If you wanna do it individually, yeah. If you wanna do it with only within your household, yeah. And then uh, it's my job as a designer to bring it all together into conversation with each other. And hopefully through that means, start bridging between those communities. And, and here I think a lot about Escobar, Arturo Escobar's work, where he says, we're not saying that, that everyone needs to be one community like um, in a cult fashion, because there is gonna be tensions in the community, but the community agrees to be within a community that can live alongside another community that might have different values, ways of being, but they understand each other and respect each other and can connect to each other in one way or another. Thank you so much for this insight. I really appreciate the fact, I mean, to me, it, it really translates to ask the people, you know, what they, what they want to be called, what they're using for themselves. Um, and now if we had a bit more time, I would ask you to play the guitar for us a little bit. Um. I'm not that cool. <laughs> my partner plays the guitar I am not that cool I wish I was I'll practice next time Regina <laughs> lovely thank you so much I will take you up on that offer <laughs> oh, yeah. thank, thank you thank you once again we really really appreciate your insights <clears throat> and I can see that our next speaker and uh, Siname is also already here so that is lovely lovely news 